is that our institutions of higher education are absolutely vital to the nation's long-term economic success. Absolutely vital. In lots of different ways, but let me give you two key ways in the context of the current economic environment. The first is, uh, I sense that we have a growing and quite substantive uh, job skill mismatch, mismatch uh, which sounds weird in the context of a 9% unemployment rate. Uh, but economists look at something called the, uh, the beverage curve. The beverage curve is simply the relationship between unemployment and job openings. And historically, there's a very uh, strong inverse relationship uh, between the two. When unemployment is rising, you know, job openings are low. And conversely, when unemployment is low, job openings are, are high. But it, uh, if you look at the recent data over the last year, almost two years, this so-called uh, beverage curve seems to be shifting out. What that means is that for any given level of job openings, we have a higher level rate of unemployment. Uh, which seems to say that uh, uh, we're having a hard time uh, matching the jobs that we have, the openings that we have, with the, with the skill set of the people that are unemployed. Uh, it's, it may be a little premature to send up the flares, uh, but this bears very, very close watching. And there are some uh, reasons to suspect that, uh, in fact, this mismatching issue is an issue. Let me give you a few. First is that a lot of the jobs lost in the recession were in construction, financial services, and manufacturing. Now, a fair share of those jobs are going to come back as housing begins to find its foot, footing and we start to see more construction. Manufacturing is already coming back. Uh, you know, uh, the rest of the world does uh, value uh, a lot of the manufactured goods that we produce, aircraft and machine tools, sophisticated instrumentation, pharmaceuticals, those kinds of things. But I think it's very fair to say that uh, employment in these industries is not going back to its pre-recession peaks. I mean, back in the boom and the bubble, these sectors of the economy were all juiced up, particularly construction and financial services because of the housing bubble, and we're not going back to those levels. So we have a, a boatload of people out there that uh, are being completely knocked out of their profession, their occupation, their industry, and they're not sure where to go. Uh, so that would argue, uh, lend support to the idea that we have a job skill mismatch. Moreover, we've got a regional problem. A lot of these people who lost their jobs were in parts of the country where the economies are pretty thin, you know, in the central part of the country, less urban areas off the coasts. You know, and you don't have to go far off the coast. I live in Philadelphia. If you just go, you know, 30 miles west, you're in Lancaster country, Gettysburg University, and in those parts of the, of the state, it's a, it's a very thin economy. There isn't a whole lot going on if, if one factory shuts down. Uh, it's very difficult for those folks to find another job, unless it's in the, in the hospital, the local hospital. And in many cases, these, home, these households are underwater. This is where a lot of the negative equity is. Uh, they can't move. Uh, they, they could move. They'd have to default, and uh, you know, uh, they'd have to strategically default on their home. But uh, nobody really wants to do that, so it makes it very difficult to move. So another reason for a little bit of nervousness here about the job skill mismatch is the fact that we have uh, big pockets of unemployed in parts of the country where it's uh, very thin uh, economies and where it's very uh, difficult to, uh, to move from. Moreover, those people who are unemployed, 9% unemployment, half of those unemployed are unemployed for more than six months. They're really long-term unemployed. And their skill, even whatever skills and marketability they did have is eroding very rapidly. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're unemployed for more than six months, certainly if you're unemployed for a year, or a year and a half, then it's going to be incredibly difficult for you uh, to get back in the labor market. One other thing to consider, uh, the jobs of the future are in different industries, and they require a uh, high, uh, high level of skills and education. Uh, we are going to uh, get our jobs in industries that produce things that we can ship overseas. And it's not just the stuff that, we, that all of you and I know that I've already discussed the aerospace and the agricultural goods and the pharmaceuticals, it's going to be in different kinds of service economies that embody highly skilled and educated workers. That is um, uh, management consulting, uh, engineering, architectural design, uh, accounting, legal, media. We need a lot more Lady Gagas very quickly. Uh, um, economic consulting, economic consulting. So 
I'm hiring people in suburban Philadelphia that are building the models that are being used by the European banks in their stress test. That's an export, right? And it, these jobs require the best and the brightest, the highly skilled and educated workers. And I'm having trouble uh, finding the best and the brightest uh, to employ in uh, my office in suburban Philadelphia. There's a, the jobs of the future are not the jobs of the past, and that's where you come in. This is so vital for the, uh, for the uh, institutions of higher education to, uh, to address this issue as quickly as possible because it goes right to the heart of our long-term uh, competitiveness. I said I was going to mention two, two uh, issues uh, that are important uh, uh, between the nexus of higher education and our, uh, our long-term economic growth. The second goes to another problem that's developing, uh, perhaps even uh, if, if, if it's not more serious, it's equally as serious, and that is the lack of business formation. Um, the thing that really makes our economy tick is our entrepreneurial um, zeal. Uh, and our entrepreneurial zeal is dormant. If you look at the data, at the number of uh, biz small businesses that are forming, uh, it's incredibly low. I mean, we've got data going back now about 25, 30 years, and the level of business formation is as low as it's been in the data by orders of magnitude. Now, some of that is probably cyclical, meaning it's related to the severity of the recession. You've got to be completely crazy to, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are saying to their spouse, you're completely crazy to start a business in this environment. So that is playing a role, and we'll see some bounce back. But there are some reasons to be nervous that there's structural things going on here, that things uh, that are going to weigh on business formation, startups, uh, for a longer period of time. One, one of which is completely out of our control, but I'll mention it because this is the most important statistic of the day. The largest single-year age group in the country is, you want to guess? You should know. Good, good guess. Who said that? You're wrong, but you know, good guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's, she's actually, I, I tease you, I tease you. That was excellent. It's 51, 51. You, your heart is, is in the right place. Uh, we had a, a lot of people at 51, 52, and 50. That's the teeth of the baby boom generation. But let's see how good she really is. Uh, what is the second large, largest single year age group after the 50-year-old the bulge? What do you think? This goes, this is really relevant to you. Ah, she's good. She's really good, but still wrong. But, yeah, okay. 20, 20, yeah, 20, 51 and 20. I, I happen to be 51, by the way, and uh, my firstborn is 20. If you want to know what's going to happen to the world for the next 20 years, just follow me. I'm doing it. I'm living it. I'm living it. Why did I bring this up? Well, how old was I when I started my company? Think back. I said I started in 1990, right? I was about 30 years old. You don't start companies when you're 51. You start them when you're 30, right? And we have a dearth of 30-somethings, at least for another decade, because that, that, there's a, that, that bulge of 20-somethings has to come up. And here's the thing that really worries me about the 20-somethings, and this is where you come in. So I give my son... He's uh, 20. His birthday was uh, last July. And I promise this is the last story I'll tell you, but it's very uh, eye-opening. To me, it was eye-opening. So his birthday was uh, July 20th last year. This was, uh, think back to last year, July 20th. The, uh, this was right after the European debt situation uh, hit the front pages. The equity market, remember, it went down quite substantively. And so I gave him cash for his birthday. And I, I had opened a Schwab account for him when he was 10 years old. So we have been trading stock for about 10 years, from, he's, from when he was 10 to when he was 20. Uh, just put that into context. You know, that's 2000 to, you know, 2010. And I said, son, I generally don't give him advice, but here I, I felt compelled uh, to give him advice. Uh, probably shouldn't have, but, you know, I, I just couldn't help myself. So I said, son, I think you should go buy stocks. You know, buy Go buy a blue chip stock. Go look at GE. GE, uh, I feel bad recommending that now that I know they don't pay taxes, but, you know, uh, GE <laughs> at 16 is a, a screaming buy, in my view, right? Uh, for God's sake, go buy MCO. MCO is the ticker for Moody's. Help your old man out, you know? I got cash when I sold it to them, but I have options. You know, that would be nice. Go buy, go buy MCO. You know what he did with the cash? 
It's still in cash. Still in cash. You know why it's still in cash? He said to me, Dad, stocks never rise in value. Stocks never rise in value. And you know what? In his waking life, they have never risen in value. They have never risen in value. So I am very concerned uh, about our 20-somethings and their perspective. And the fact that the stock market hasn't gone up for 10 years also means that there's left private equity money, venture capital money going into the equity market, going into financing startups. We're not getting the business formation, and that goes uh, right to where you all come in. You've got to change this fast, because this is what makes our economy tick. Makes our economy tick.